we all grew up in different times, different histories, right? And even those of us who may be similar in ages, you grew up in different locations. Some of you grew up in the South. Others, others of you grew up in the North. Maybe some in the Midwest. Maybe some uh, other places. Maybe some of you even grew up in other countries for parts of your life. I don't know. We have so many different stories in this room, right? And even the stories that are ours individually, when you think about your family and branching out from that, your families are scattered across this country or scattered across the world in some instances. Your parents came from different locations and grandparents came from different locations. Each of us experiences history very individually and at the same time collectively. And it's one of those bizarre sort of things that Everything comes together uh, to be a collective. And though we all grow up in different times and experience moments in history differently, we all recognize, I think, the times in history, especially when you think about, think about national history, when there's been this sort of collective call to action. And I, th- I thought this week about things like the Revolutionary War. Right? Think back to that time. When men and women openly took up arms against a British empire that wanted to rule this new world. And many of our ancestors said, no, we're done with that. We're tired of that. We don't want you to rule over us any longer. And so collectively they stood up and they said, no. You could think back to the Underground Railroad, uh, railroad, to the men and women who stood up against slavery and helped, uh, helped ferry uh, slaves from the south to the north so that they could get out of bondage. You can think back to the protests, to certain wars, and those who viewed them as unjust. You can think back to the nonviolent protests of the civil rights movement, which aimed to provide the same protection, the same rights under the law to black people as white men had enjoyed for as long as this country has been around. And each of those moments that I just described, and clearly there are a whole lot more than that, but each of those moments, those were calls to action nationally. They were calls to action. Not everyone chose to participate. It wasn't necessary for everyone to participate in them, but those calls to action, I think, alter the psyche of individuals and collectively as a nation. They, they change who we are And how we respond to calls to action tells us who we are. Now, for us as Christians, the most important call to action is the call to serve God. Not national interest, not individual interest, not corporate interest, but God's interest in the world. And in Isaiah 61, which we're about to read, I believe that we see such a call to action. Isaiah envisions a servant receiving that call, and being filled with the Spirit of the Lord. Men and women throughout the course of history have received God's call to action, and how we respond to His call tells us who we are. So let's read Isaiah 61, and then we're going to talk about what I think it might mean for us. The Word of the Lord from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring Good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In their righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, repairing cities destroyed long ago. They will revive them, though they have been deserted for many generations. Foreigners will be your servants. They will feed your flocks and plow your fields and tend your vineyards. You will be called priests of the Lord, ministers of our God. You will feed on the treasures of the nations and boast in their riches. Instead of shame and dishonor, you will enjoy a double share of honor. You will possess a double portion of prosperity in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant 
with them. Their descendants will be recognized and honored among the nations. Everyone will realize that they are a people the Lord has blessed. I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom in his wedding suit or a bride with her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. It's a really beautiful picture, isn't it? There's a lot of great imagery in Isaiah 61. So I want to talk about this idea of being anointed by the Spirit. And that starts, of course, with the Spirit-filled servant that Isaiah talks about here. Now, the word, in, the word spirit in Hebrew is the same word for breath or wind. Many of you actually probably already know that. It's the word ruach in, spirit, in, uh, in Hebrew. It's this really great word that carries multiple meanings and gets used in many ways. So the word here in Isaiah 61 for spirit also means breath or wind. And again, it's actually the same word that gets used way back in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where we first see it show up where we read, the earth was formless and empty, and darkness covered the deep waters, and the spirit, or the breath, or the wind of God, was hovering over the surface of the waters. Now this spirit, this breath, this wind, actually shows up all over the Old Testament. When you go back and you read the Old Testament, and when you read through it, you can see it everywhere. It's all over. And you can imagine, and you'd be correct to do so, that Christians for centuries have made the connection to the Holy Spirit we see in the New Testament with that same spirit or breath or wind from God being the Holy Spirit. Now, your mileage can vary on passage to passage in the Old Testament on whether you actually think that that one, that that passage is talking about the Holy Spirit or not. But there is a very strong case to be made, I think. And this passage in Isaiah 61 is actually one of the strongest places that we can point to that perhaps this word ruach, spirit, or breath, or wind, does point to the Holy Spirit. But I want to return to that in just a few minutes. In Isaiah's time, let's think about it from Isaiah's time, from the standpoint of the people who are reading this uh, or, or hearing him speak it to them. What would they have assumed about this message? What would they have thought uh, about this spirit-filled servant. Who is this guy to them? Who is this person to them? They probably would have envisioned that Isaiah represents the spirit-filled servant, at least in his time, that it is upon him to bring this good news, to speak this good news. And what was Isaiah's ministry? As a spirit-filled servant, as somebody who delivered good news to the nation of Israel, sometimes bad news, but ultimately would turn out for good in the end. What I find interesting is that Isaiah doesn't name the servant at all. He doesn't say, and this points to some future person down the line, some future king to come after David, in the line of David. Isaiah doesn't do any of that for us. He doesn't name this person. He doesn't clarify. He doesn't give us individual details that we could point to and say, this is the person who is the spirit-filled servant from chapter 61. Although, they certainly wouldn't have had chapters back then. What does that tell us? Why? Why doesn't Isaiah name the Spirit-filled servant here? I wonder if that sets up for us that this passage might then be more universally applied than to just one individual person. Now, we're going to come back to the person that at least Luke believes ultimately fulfills this passage, and I don't disagree with Luke. But perhaps, perhaps not naming this person means that it could also apply more universally to all people who are spirit-filled from God. That all of us can be this type of servant for the Lord. If the, if the servant had been specifically named or if individual details had been given so that the person could be particularly applied to this, what happens in that case is that people read something like this and they go, well, that's not for me. I can skip over that. 
I don't need to bother with it. Nothing in it applies to me, so what's the point in, in bothering with, with reading it anyway? The characteristics of the spirit-filled person are what are really important in this passage. They are someone who does what? They bring good news. Now, I looked because I wanted to verify this. I looked in the Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. In many cases, the Septuagint representing probably a slightly older uh, tradition than we have in the Hebrew text itself. And that verb is yongelizo. Now, you know this word, although you don't think you do, because I just said it in Greek. But that, that verb, that word is evangelism. Evangelism. That word in Greek, the noun, is what we translate as good news or gospel. You only think the gospel doesn't show up in the Old Testament. Well, here it is. Isaiah 61, the spirit-filled servant, tells the good news or the gospel of the Lord. An evangelist is someone who not just evangelizes. you got to get a little more. you got to branch out from you. She's in the same word over and over again. An evangelist is someone who tells good news. So who is this spirit-filled person? Someone who shares the good news, someone who shares the gospel, but not just any good news. And there's a lot of good news to share. It's exciting to hear good news, isn't it? Somebody's had a baby. That's good news. Somebody got married. That's really good news. But that's not the good news that we're tasked with sharing. As great as that news can be, that's not the good news of the gospel. There is a particular good news to share. The good news to be shared, how does Isaiah put it? That those imprisoned will be freed. That those who mourn will be comforted very soon. The good news is that restoration, reconciliation, redemption is happening. The good news is that God is not done with this earth. That God is not done with His people. God has not decided to turn his back on those who have turned their backs on him. The good news is that God is still and always will be our Savior. And one final note about this good news. Notice for whom, again, the servant will proclaim it. It's everybody you wouldn't expect. It's the poor. It's those in prison. It's the hurting. It's the downtrodden, the mourning. It's everyone in our society and in Isaiah's society, that people want to kick to the curb and have nothing to do with. It's everyone that we want to just pass by, like the person that I have up on the screen in this photo. It's everybody like that that we actively and intentionally avoid. Those are the people for whom this good news is meant to be shared. At least that's what Isaiah is saying here. We might expect the CEO, uh, the, the, the good news to be shared with CEOs, the powerful, the very rich, the wealthy in our society. And we think that because that's mostly what our churches reflect. Those are the types of people who show up to church. And it's not that the gospel isn't for them at all. But it seems to me that we're missing some people. It seems to me that we've forgotten what Isaiah has said here in Isaiah 61. Let's talk about Jesus as the ultimate example of the Spirit-filled servant, because yes, yes, you know that ultimately everything comes back to Jesus. Now, I mentioned before that Isaiah 61 stands out to me as one of the strongest cases that the Spirit, often mentioned in the Old Testament, would in fact be the Holy Spirit. Perhaps not at all, but I think in many cases you can, you can make that. You can make a solid case about that. But this one in particular stands out above the rest, and it's because of Luke. Ah, we're going to Luke's gospel next week. Lo and behold. Luke chapter 4. I'm going to turn over and read that for you. Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. We read this. Then Jesus returned to Galilee. In other words, his home base. Filled with, you guessed it, the Holy Spirit's power. Reports about him spread quickly through the whole region. He taught regularly in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. 
when he came to the village of Nazareth, his boyhood home. He went, as usual, to the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read the Scriptures. The scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him. This just happened to be handed to him, the scroll of Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place. He just happened to find the place where this was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. He rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down. All eyes in the synagogue looked at him intently. Then he began to speak to them. The scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. In Luke, we get this direct linking of Jesus, directed by the Spirit in verse 14, with the passage that we see in Isaiah 61. And it makes it abundantly clear, at least in Luke's eyes and in ours as well, that Jesus is the Spirit-filled servant Isaiah wrote about all those years ago. And I could end this sermon right there. We could be done. I could call it quits. And we would all stand and cheer, Jesus is the fulfillment. But I think that does this passage a disservice. I don't think it goes far enough. We're so fond of just answering every riddle in church with Jesus, right? Every question that, that gets asked, somebody's going to say, Jesus has got to be the answer. The proclamation that Jesus is the answer is not the end. Jesus isn't just the fulfillment of Isaiah 61. He is the example of of Isaiah 61 for us. There's a larger purpose to the Spirit's work than just showing us that Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 61. As great as that is, that's not the end of Isaiah 61. And that larger work of the Spirit is seen when you read the rest of Luke, when you read Acts. Luke does this masterful job of displaying the works, uh, the, the Spirit's work through Jesus but then how that work transitions from Jesus to his disciples. It doesn't end just because Jesus goes, out, goes back to heaven. It continues on through the disciples all the way down to us. The Word of God. Jesus, the Word of God, isn't just a proclamation. It is action in this world. It isn't just spoken, it's done. It's not enough to stand on the street corner and scream the name of Jesus at everyone who passes by. It's not enough to walk by the person who's holding up a sign and yell, Jesus, at them. And think, cool, I'm done. I've done my job. They need nothing else from me than to yell Jesus at them. As if, and we treat it almost as if it's some sort of magical talisman. Right? This magical word that we can just speak over people. If I say Jesus over you, somehow you're going to be bright as rain in the next few minutes. That's how we treat the name of Jesus. We also have something to do in this world. The Spirit of God is active, not just through word, but through action, to actually repair broken societies. Do we have a broken society? You can answer that question. And we all know the answer is yes. So then the, the follow-up question is, then what are we doing about it? Not what are we saying about it? Not are we saying the name Jesus enough? Are we actively trying to repair our broken society, this broken world? Jesus' ministry sets the example for us, empowered by the Spirit to work on this mission of repair from the bottom up or the top down? From the bottom up. Again, I'll call your attention to those the Spirit-filled servant was sent. It isn't that the good news in gospel, again, doesn't have anything to say to people who are wealthy and powerful and rich. It's not that it has zero impact on, on them. 
But we see this fulfilled in, Je- in Jesus' ministry as well. Who are those who follow Jesus most closely? Is it the powerful? Is it the wealthy of his day? No. It's those who have nothing else to lose. It's the poor, the downtrodden, the hurting. The lower classes followed him and listened to him because those who had everything had nothing to lose, they felt like. They had no reason to follow Jesus. Jesus being this spirit-filled servant is important because his example fuels our mission in the world, or it ought to. It's important to remember that Isaiah 61 goes beyond providing us an an exercise in just spiritual thinking, wondering who this servant could be. Luke identifies the servant as Jesus. And then Jesus hands over that mission to us, his disciples. And that tells us everything we need to know. We proclaim the message of Isaiah 61 through physical acts, through good deeds, as well as through spoken words. The two go together. God's mission impacts the world through us, the Spirit-filled servants, willing to go, willing to get to work in the world and to help restore order to His creation. That's the good news of Isaiah 61. That's the gospel. We have something to do with it. So to close out today, to think about a couple of things to take away, is God's mission and vision for the world your mission and vision for the world? And the first thing you have to do there, of course, is answer the question, what is God's mission and vision for the world? Is it that the world stays as it is right now? Boy, I sure hope not. If that's the answer, if it's that everything should stay as is, keep the status quo, do what you're doing, nothing else needs to change, that doesn't sound like a heaven I want to be a part of. That doesn't sound like a mission that I want to be a part of. So then the follow-up question is, then what is God's mission and vision for the world? What is his mission and vision for your neighbor, for your coworker, for the barista you got your coffee from yesterday? Not me, because I don't drink coffee. Nasty stuff. What does it mean? What is God's mission and vision for the world? And what does it mean for us? How do we bring our mission and vision into alignment with And then the second thing is, are you recognizing and doing the good works God prepared for you to do? You know, Paul has this great thing in Philippians. No, Ephesians. In Ephesians, God has prepared good works in advance for us to do. In other words, there are moments, there are things that God has specifically set up for us along the way of our lives to recognize and then do them. My question is, are we recognizing them, and are we doing them? Or are we missing them? And how do we get better about seeing them? Are we being spirit-filled servants? That's what I want us to ask today. Are we being spirit-filled servants? Because yes, ultimately that passage applies to Jesus. Yes, ultimately, he's the fulfillment. He is the perfect fulfillment and embodiment of a spirit-filled servant. But guess what? He's not the only one. You are a spirit-filled servant. I am a spirit-filled servant. And so, am I making my task the same as Jesus to bring the good news to people? We have our family time now. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, you want to come forward and say, I haven't been doing this great. This has not been my priority the last month. I want to make it my priority. Guess what? Yay. Let us pray for you in that endeavor. Let us support you in that goal. Because that's what we do as a family. Support each other. Maybe you have some prayer requests that you need on somebody else's behalf. Bring that to our attention as well. 
Maybe there's something for which you want to be thankful this morning and celebrate with us. As I said before, a new birth, a new marriage isn't the good news, but it is good news, and we want to hear that as well. So anything that you want to come let us know about, anything that you want support from this family for, we want to help you with that. So let us know about those things as we stand.